<laughs> so last week, last weekend, I was looking up something related to JoJo's Bizarre Adventure on Wikipedia for like the hundredth time. I think I was looking up the number of volumes that were sold because the manga is like one of the best selling mangas of all time. I want to see the rankings. And for some reason, I was like, you know what, let's check out. I was really curious to see what the numbers were like for Sekaiichi Hatsukoi. An anime I watched back in high school, it was like my thing back in high school, I absolutely loved it. I was really curious to see how popular that was, so I go to the Wikipedia page, okay, and I see, okay, the manga's still technically going, they release like one volume a year, which is why like I gave up on reading ahead of it, and like trying to keep up with it, I was like, this takes too long, I have no idea where the story's going, we'll just see what happens and then I see on the Wikipedia page let me let me just pull it up one second one sec I'll read it out right now it says a new anime adaptation focused on the proposal arc has been announced to celebrate the fifth anniversary of the new Emerald magazine it premiered on February 1st 2020 2020 like two years ago oh my gosh it was two years ago but two years ago, 2020, I, that was like yesterday for me. I remember 2020. So the fact that in very recent years, another installment, anime installment for this series that I've long forgotten about came out and I didn't know about it. E excuse me. Fudge. And so what did I do that morning on Saturday? I looked it up online and I watched it. I watched it again, freaking loved it. I'll talk about it in a bit, but I freaking loved it. And then what did I do? And then what did I do? I subscribed to Funimation. I, I subscribed for the free trial, but they charge me anyway, but I have the money right now, so it's fine. I spent that whole weekend watching the series, the entire series, 24 episodes plus the two OVAs. And then the movie on my way to work on Monday morning. It's a, it's a short movie, so it's like, it was totally doable. But yeah, I watched it on Monday and I wanted to make this video. I was like, I want to talk about this. Let's talk about this. But of course I had to plan it. I had to time it. So I spent the week like just thinking about what I want to say, making notes, and here we are. Okay, I guess this started. Let's talk about the actual... The first thing I watched, the proposal arc. The pr it's called like Sekaiichi Hatsukoi Propose Hen. So yeah, I loved it. It was literally just a special, I don't know why it was called a movie. Some sources say it was called a movie, but it was only like 20 minutes and they actually showed it. I think they showed it in select theaters in Japan. I don't know why, but they did. So yeah, but it's pretty much like an OVA. Well, it's really just like another episode. It's just a special. That's ultimately what it is. It was cute, it was wholesome, and it was very nostalgic for me because they brought back the music, they brought back the characters, the art style and animation looks pretty much the same. I haven't noticed a major difference, I'm pretty sure. I think if you put them next to each other, you'll see the difference, but if you haven't seen it in a while, like, it, it looks the same to me. So the point is, it was very nostalgic for me to see these characters again and just watch it and yeah, it was just cute and special. There's no actual plot. The entire, um, the whole premise of the, of this special was that, um, their co-workers, so two of their co-workers are getting married, so, you know, for a refresher for anyone, all the characters work in the manga industry, they work at Marukawa Publishing, two of the co-workers get married, so they're all invited to the wedding, it's really more of a networking event, funnily enough, and then, we get a few minutes with every couple from the series, just really after the wedding, just some cute moments here and there. Nothing like too crazy, nothing problematic, I promise. Yes, even with Hattori and Yoshino, promise nothing problematic. It was just sweet and wholesome. And yeah, I loved it. I loved hearing their voices again. And can we talk about the voices? Oh my gosh, 
Hattori. Hattori. I heard it. The moment I heard it in that conversation with him and Yoshino, I was like, no. No. No, there's no way. And then I looked it up. Boo Charity from JoJo's Bizarre Adventure. Bro, like, Hattori, one of the more controversial characters from this series. And when I watched it back when I was younger, I just got into JoJo's Bizarre Adventure this past summer. And to learn that he shares a voice actor with one of my favorite characters from Golden Wind. The moment I heard it's like, no freaking way, no freaking way. This is unreal. And it gets better. I think at some point I, I must have been looking up I think yeah I was on the Wikipedia page I was looking up the voice actors for every character or really all the main characters from World's Greatest First Love to see if I know them from mainly JoJo's or Attack on Titan or really any other anime but honestly those are the only two I care about right now Takano Takano oh, so as I was re-watching this series episode 2 I was like you know what? Maybe I know his voice. Maybe I do. Diavolo. Guys, Diavolo. He voices Diavolo. Bro! <laughs> it's so funny, because like when I watched Golden Wind, I honestly didn't care for Diavolo's voice. The voice actor does a great job, so it's not his fault. It's like, I didn't... I felt the... When I watched it the first time, I thought the voice was just a generic, deep voice. It didn't really stand out to me. I didn't really get anything from it. But funnily enough, for Takano Masamune, the character he voices in World's Greatest First Love, I think he does a fantastic job there. Portraying like this, I guess in some of the more emotional moments, like this sentimentality to it. And especially in that high school episode, he's just much more gentle. Oh my gosh, I I keep forgetting the word for it, but you know, it's like so gent- where you can tell in their voice that they actually love someone very much, or you can tell just by listening to their voice how hurt they are, or how in love they are, like, I think he just nails it. Pa apologies in advance for butchering the name, but Katsuyuki Konoshi, the voice actor for Takano and Diavolo, does, does, a, does a fantastic job, and looking back, as voice work for Takano and also Diavolo. I think he, he shines best as Diavolo when he Diablo is actually yelling and like the final fight when he's like panicking and also like asserting like his power and dominance and you know just really coming across as this evil a-hole, frankly. Yeah, he fantastic job there. With Takano, I love his work voice acting for Takano though. Like, when Takano's yelling, it's fantastic. The one iconic scene of Takano laughing. Yeah, yeah, that, that's the stuff. That's the stuff. Yeah, it just brings a sentimentality to the role. It's deep seriousness that obviously we don't see with Diavolo. That, but he just does such a great job with Takano that it really did shock me that, like, the voice actor who I didn't really care for at first, at first, I, I love him now, care for at first just with Diablo is like turns out I actually loved it back in high school back when I um watched Sekaiichi Hatsukoi it's just so cool to see like I actually know these voice actors and now that I got into JoJo's I'm seeing them in JoJo or Attack on Titan and it's so great oh I love it so much so going back to it yeah I said everything I wanted about Proposed Hen I was really glad to see my favorite couples my favorites I think my favorite back in the day was probably Yuki, um, Yukina and Kisa. Um, I don't really know why. I just love when they're actually a couple. I love their moments. I feel like the development of them becoming a couple is still like not the most realistic. But when they're actually together, and even the manga too, when I read bits of the manga, they have some just really cute moments. I love their story. And also seeing Yokozawa and Kirishima, I was really surprised to see that. So, I was just really happy to see that. So that's all I have to say about Propose Hen. Um, yeah, that's all I have to say there. Let's talk about the series. Now, this is not going to be a breakdown of the series. 
or an episode by episode thing. I was considering doing an episode by episode thing, but I think I'm just going to talk more broadly, just my thoughts about the series. But before we do that, we do have to talk about the more serious problematic part of it. So, you know, boys love. Boys love anime and manga, um, yaoi, all of that. I'm not familiar with that many works in the genre. The only ones I'm familiar with are Sekaiichi Hatsukoi, its counter, its predecessor, Junja Romanica, Love Stage, and the first two episodes of Super Lovers. And just the first two episodes, we are not going to go past that. I did not go past that because I was freaking disgusted. Yeah, and then another counterpart is... Um, Kiss Him, Not Me. That's one of my first anime. I never really kept track. I think that was my first attempt to like get into the entire anime genre. But yeah, I watched that and it does. It follows a girl who loves boys love media. There's that. And before anyone asks, I have seen Yuri on Ice and I love it. I don't think that actually counts as boys love because it's not part of the genre because the characters are gay or they're in love. Like, you know same-sex relationships here and there, but it's not the focus, so I don't think it actually counts as boys' love. Genre as a whole, there are, like, here and there, there are many problematic elements. It's there it is so many instances where they glorify abuse and rape. Like, that's true. That's true. That's very prevalent. It's a lot more prevalent in the manga for Sekaiichi Hatsukoi and the light novels, too. Especially the light novels, because I believe Chiaki's and Hattori's entire story is told through light novels, and they're... Yeah, it's it's not good. Like, all their respective scenes in the anime, and the anime, most of them are watered down to kiss scenes mo that are mostly consensual. I say, what I mean, like, more in a numbers thing, like, these are consensual, and there's, like, one or two that aren't. That's what I mean when I say mostly. Um, so, yeah, most of them are consensual, whereas I, I think all of them, I I did not revisit the light novels for this because I did not want to read those. I didn't revisit that, I did not want to because of those rape scenes. They're not love scenes, they are rape scenes. And again, there are hints of that in the anime, but I feel like it's big enough that you could just ignore it. I basically just did that. That is very prevalent in the genre and when I finally decided to rewatch this anime, World's Greatest First Love, I was a little worried. I was truly worried that it wouldn't hold up, that like, I was worried about how I would feel about it. That's something that meant so much to me back in the day that I would have to give it up forever. And I would, I would like, I would do it if that was the case. But you know, it's, you know, it just really sucks when something you love, you realize that it is problematic, that it's, honestly not good like that's the worst feeling when something you used to love like is actually like bad now so i was worried about how i would like and even then even if i didn't love it as much like does it hold up as on its own or should i like part ways with it forever i was pretty worried and, even, and i think that's part of the reason why i've been putting it off i never or i didn't really have any motivation to pick it up again also to be fair it wasn't available on any other streaming service i currently had now i have Funimation and it's available there but I think that's why over the years I just never thought about or never actually went forward to rewatch it so what was my experience watching it I watched it I laughed I got really teary-eyed I appreciated a lot of moments that I've forgotten about I appreciated little things here and there and now that I've like really taking animation seriously and storytelling seriously and like I'm not intentionally analyzing every moment but there are things here and there that I catch that I really come to appreciate when stories show like foreshadowing moments or parallels here and there from like the beginning to the end motifs running gags things like that I've come to appreciate that a lot and I realized while watching it Sekaiichi Hatsukoi the anime has a lot of that and I love it so much. So ultimately, how bad was it when I watched it? To my surprise, 
not as bad as I thought. I actually really enjoyed it. I love it. I think I'd lo I loved it just as much as I did in high school. Maybe a little bit more than I, wa than I did back in high school. I love it because I watched it in high school. And then I love it because I can still enjoy it to this day. That's what it is. I don't love it any less. Maybe I like it a little bit more. So that's what it is. So I was pleasantly surprised to see that. And I even with the problematic elements. And here's why I say that. Because I do want to make it clear. First of all, I also want to clarify... I'm only talking about the anime version, the anime adaptation of the manga. The manga itself, the manga plus the light novels, yeah, some parts of it, like, it's, again, the full-on rape scenes in the light novels, heavily toned down, sometimes cut out altogether in the anime. And actually, the only problematic couples really come from Takano and Onodera, so their pairing and Hattori and Yoshino, their pairing. The other two couples don't really have that. In the case of Onodera and Takano, there are many scenes where Takano basically forces a kiss on Onodera, and Onodera is, like, trying to get out of it. It's not that... But the way it's portrayed in both the anime and the manga is that the idea is that he loves Takano. He does want this, but he's afraid to embrace it because he doesn't want to get hurt again. So that's why we see him, like, getting sucked into it. Because that's the way they're trying to portray it. Now, in real life, no matter what, you shouldn't do that. And, you know, I don't support it in the manga or the anime. I'm not a fan of those moments when Takano's trying to force him. But understand that the dynamic, the point is that the whole story is about Onodera trying to admit to Takano. Or trying to get Onodera to admit to Takano that he loves him, to admit that he loves Takano, that he still loves him after all this time, and that he really does want to be with him. That's the way it's told, like, that's the point. It's not that, it's not that he doesn't, the point is he does want it, but he's afraid to admit it. Nonetheless, like, those scenes where Takano's basically forcing him, the point is, like, it's, for me personally, it's a little bit more digestible in the anime, and plus, there's still a plethora of other scenes, like, that I can focus on instead, instead of the more, like, questionable, problematic scenes. Like, those scenes where Takano's forcing Onodera to kiss him, they're so quick I can skip over it. I know it's about, not the best way to put it. Like, they're so quick I can focus on the rest. I can focus on the characters. I can focus on the humor. I can focus on the music. Oh my god, the music. At first, it is... Four. So the very in the very first episode, Takano kisses Onodera not because of romance, but actually because he's trying to demonstrate a kiss, like what a kiss looks like from a certain angle, to this mangaka. I'm sorry if I mispronounced that word. So Takano does it to his coworker. And then in episode three, there's that kissing. He's trying to have sex with him. There's that kissing at the end of episode three. And um, I believe in episode. He, I forget what episode is, but it's when they're at the library. Again, Takano tries to get Onodera to admit that he loves him. Things really do go up from there. Because in episode 14, I believe episode 14, so when Takano and Onodera go for a drive and they see the snow, and there's this beautiful scene where they both realize that back in high school they had the same dream of just spending Christmas with each other. And it was just so beautifully done, it was so sweet, and there they kiss and they have sex. And it's completely consensual, and Onodera, he, even though he doesn't want to admit to himself, he still doesn't want to admit that he loves Takano. This, this one was consensual, and it was just so beautiful and so well done. And then after that, we just have even more scenes of them making love and kissing and embracing and those are consensual and i really love those so we really do see more of that of onodera like giving into it because he wants to not because he's being forced but because he does want to yeah like the scene where takano's on his way to see yokozawa his cat and onodera doesn't want him to go because he doesn't want to lose takano he holds him back and then he admits, just beautiful, this is such a beautiful scene. And he admits 
his fiance, An, or Ann, I'm gonna call her An Chen, that's easier to say, confessed to him back in high school and he turned her down because he was in love with Takano. And they have this beautiful scene where they kiss. Oh, it's just like so sweet and gentle and sentimental, truly beautiful. And then they have a similar one. Similar thing happens, episode 23, when Ohidera finally admits that he loves him, only to be like, <laughs> only to be like, beat out by the rain, so no one can hear it. But yeah, they have, it's just beautiful when they get together at the end. It's really beautiful. So at the end of it, like, I do acknowledge the problematic aspects. And for, you know, if people out there aren't comfortable with it, that's t completely valid. I almost said totally, but I said completely valid. It's completely valid. You have every right to feel that way. And for me, just, I'm not trying to justify. I'm not trying to justify it at all. It's more like me loving something and acknowledging its flaws, acknowledging where it could have gone better. And actually, I'm, I'm gonna talk about it later too, but that's a big thing with this show that like, the reason why I love it so much is because it has so much potential to be better. It's already great. If we got rid of the problematic elements and then add some things, it could be even greater. So that's really the thing here. Like I love, overall, I love their development. And from when I read ahead in the manga a while ago, I do love some other things here and there. The little bits of development they get. Like one of the big things in the manga is that they realized, yeah, they love each other, but how much do they actually know about each other? They loved each other back in high school. It was more like, you know, a high school crush and they had feelings for each other, but they didn't, but well, one, they did for a pretty short amount of time. Sorry, I just noticed something. They did for a short amount of time, but there's still so much that they don't know about each other. That's covered in the manga. And yeah, I hope, I still hope that one day gets ad animated, adapted. I'd love to see that. Those are all the big things I have to say about it. You know what? Actually, no, there is one more thing. Actually, no, there is one more thing that I just grew to appreciate. So remember when I talked about, like, I guess the storytelling elements that I've come to love in shows now? Again, with motifs, foreshad foreshadowing, and parallels. I realize upon watching this, like, as much as I... A part of me still wants a season three, even though I kind of gave up hope. And even back in the day, I was insistent on getting a season three. Now, I still want a season three, but I'd be happy if we never got a season three. Because the end of season two does such a good job of wrapping up major things, really important things. I, I think it I think it works as a finale, as a series finale. And that's both episodes 23 and 24. And I'm gonna explain why. Because in episode 23, really important things happen. One, Onodera does admit that he loves Takano. Now, even though the joke is that for basically the rain overpowered him, you know, no one could hear it. We didn't get to hear as the viewer, Takano didn't get to hear his confession because of the rain. Even though that's the joke. In the next scene, we get Onodera and Yokozawa in the elevator. And on his way out, the last thing Yokozawa asks him is, one more thing, do you love Masamune? Do you love Takano, essentially? And at this point, Onodera can't deny it anymore. He actually learns back in episode 22, he realizes that he needs to be upfront and honest with his feelings, both to Anne and to Takano. He has to tell, he owes it to Takano. He owes it to him to like explain his true feelings, to be honest and have this conversation. He realizes back in episode 22 and episode 23 here, when he's finally being asked upfront, do you love him? He's shy, but he's not hesitant. He shyly admits. Hi. Yes. He loves him. He can't hide it. So again, even though the joke's that when he, he said to Takano, but he couldn't be heard because of the rain, here in the scene, he admits it, both to himself and out loud to Yokozawa, the love rival. And that, I love that development. 
So that's the first reason. One, we tied up that. Secondly, all throughout the series, Ona there is trying to reconcile the fact that he wants to be a literature editor, but then got put in the manga department. And he wasn't happy about that. We get that in episode one, he's considering transferring, and then I forget what episode it is, but an episode but sometime later he meets other literature editors. I, I think he meets an author that he previously worked with. And again, that he has a dilemma of should he continue with manga or should he transfer to literature? His true calling. In episode 23, he finally tells Yokozawa, you know what, I think I'm going to stick with manga for a while, and I appreciate it if you help me out. So we get a wrap up on that. Just beautiful, and we get finality with that. So both with his own journey, like in terms of his career, but also with his love with Takano. We do get that sense of finality, which is why it does work as a finale. But then there's also episode 24, which tells the love story from back in high school, but from Takano's point of view. Now, I don't know about you guys, but when I watched it back in the day, even I was wondering, like, what is it that Takano sees in Onodera? Like, why did he fall in love with Onodera? When I first saw that episode where we get it from Takano's point of view, I was truly surprised because this is exactly what I wanted, and we finally got to see it. So we see his story from his point of view, and we really do see, like, why he fell in love with Onodera. Onodera was the one who made him smile for the first time, who truly made him believe in happiness and love and compassion, just being nice to each other simply because you love each other. And I realized, to go back to my point of this being a fantastic finale, a good finale, a bookend for the animated series, is because it parallels the OVA. And interestingly, I think the reason why I didn't realize this earlier was because I actually watched the anime seasons one and two so back in high school I watched the anime without watching the OVAs because the OVAs weren't available on Crunchyroll so actually I saw the anime first and I saw the OVA that gives like the full backstory from Onodera's point of view I was like oh that makes sense so we actually meet like we actually meet the cat in the OVA and then we revisit the cat in like episode seven or eight or something like that like that makes a lot more sense so really it was the ova came out first and then we got season one and then we got the ova two and then we got season two and then that final episode of season two and of course of the series right now kind of mirrors the ova well it doesn't exactly mirror but it gives more context because the ova is the love story from onodera's point of view ultimately falling in love with Takano and then stalking him in the library. Ultimately, we see them, like, we see him confess to Takano, and we see him go to his house. And the way it's framed, it looks like it happens in one day, but actually we see in the final episode, episode 24, or season 2, episode 12, however you want to look at it, but that's not exactly what happened. I think it actually took place over a couple days, and then at the very end, it's like, hey, do you want to come over to my house? And then the events from the OVA happen. But the point is, we see it from Takano's point of view. See him try to reconcile, like, how could he be with a guy? How could I be with this kid who doesn't even know me? We've never had a conversation. Point is, it's just really well done. And, like, just putting it... I don't know, I just think it was like so cool, like put a nice book into the series to finally see from Takano's point of view to see that, yeah, he really does love Onodera. Onodera was in fact his true love and it's just so cool. And when you watch it, this whole time from Onodera's point of view, he's doubting himself. He's doubting himself. Like, does Takano really love me or is he just playing with me? And then to actually get it from Takano's point of view is just something I wasn't expecting, but it was exactly what I wanted. And... I loved it so much. And again, with Junji Romanica, let's just talk about Akihiko Usami. Yeah, he's a bad character. Like, I don't have any reason to root for him. I feel like the development of most of the couples, it's just like, you look at a character and then you're immediately in love with them. And, I think that's important, and you immediately go out to pursue them and honestly, you become really possessive of them. It's different from Onodera's case, because Onodera's case is a little bit more relatable. I mean, I certainly related to it, just, like, falling in love with someone in high school and, like, yeah, you know you don't know much about them, but you still want to know more about them. Whereas, 
I don't know, Usami Akihiko, like, I can't relate to him. We're not going to get his side of things. Like, truly, what is it about Misaki that he fell in love with? And I guess, the, or I guess the bigger thing, because you can make cases here and there. I guess the big thing I want to point out is just how human it is. Takano's backstory is such a good backstory. And it's, like, very human. Like, he didn't have a good home life. He's neglected. He doesn't have people who truly care about him. So when this character shows up, when Onodera shows up, and just is so pure and genuine and truly loves him, it moves him and it makes him laugh for the first time, makes him smile. And it's so beautiful and wholesome. And it's just, it's beautiful. And like I say, it's a great finale. It's a nice callback or parallel to the OVA. And I love it. So for all those reasons, I... Again, as much as I, a part of me still wants a season three, I just love the characters and the voice actors and the art and the music. Yeah, I love it so much. And I'm, I'm content if we don't ever get, I mean, at least I can say it is finished, makes sense. It's not like, God bless Infinity Train, but it's not like Infinity Train where it cut off when it wasn't supposed to, or it ended when it wasn't really supposed to end. So now we're just left with this cliffhanger. Not fun. Not fun at all. Well, that drained my battery. Okay, let's talk about the other couples. So, I'm just gonna go in order from, like, their appearance. Yoshino and Hattori. I think they're known as, like, Domestica or something among fans. I think they're, like, the least popular couple because of how problematic Hattori is, especially. And that's definitely the case in the light novels. Again, I don't- I am not gonna reread those. So I was really curious about what I would think about them. How would I feel when I was watching them in the anime? Honestly, there, there are actually a lot of moments that I like between them. Actually, I think I like them more than when I watched it back in high school. I'm seeing things here that I didn't see back then. So I guess one thing I do want to get out of the way, I still don't like, you know, I still don't like the scenes where Hattori is forcing him. I think that doesn't happen as often in the anime. In the anime, not in the light novels. In the anime, that doesn't happen as often as I thought it did. Okay, actually, let me just go down the line. So, the first is when Yoshino's sleeping, and then he wakes up and sees the Hattori's kissing him. Now, in the anime, it's just a kiss. In the light novels, it's a full-on rape scene. I'm sorry, I forgot to include this, so if it looks different, well, that's why. In the anime, Hattori references that he's gonna punish Yoshino, and the, at first I didn't get it, but actually, in the light novel, punishment actually equates to rape, basically. Not fun, and honestly, it's also bad because in the novel, Yosh it's told from Yoshino's point of view, and it's said, and like, he it even says in the narration that he really doesn't enjoy being this, like, vulnerable or this submissive and like in this case he doesn't enjoy it at all which just befuddles me even more okay but back to the anime so that scene aside that scene aside we do see very early on that Yoshino does have feelings for Hattori his own feelings not influenced by Hattori at all so what happens is at some point he sees Yanase and Hattori. I'm sorry if you can I'm sorry if you can hear that. He sees Yanase and Hattori in what looks like from his point of view to be a kiss. We basically see like Hattori holding Yosh sorry, holding Yanase by the collar of his shirt and then pulling him upward. And from Yoshino's point of view, it looks like a kiss. And he's pondering over this, like, why didn't he know about it? Why didn't he know that they were dating? Again, he assumes it's a kiss and thinks that maybe they're in love with each other, that they're dating. Or that they're feeling like something's going on and he doesn't know about it. And then he says, like, too bad, too bad Hattori's not interested in me. And he's like, whoa, whoa, what the hell did I just say? I think a better way to put it, I think, would be like, if, like, if only he were in love with me. Yeah, then this is before Hattori actually, I believe this is actually before the scene where Yoshino sleeping and Hattori kisses him. I think it is. Pretty sure it, yeah, yeah, actually it is. He's thinking these things. And then when Hattori kisses him, he's confused. Like, wait, aren't you in love with Yanase? And then at the end, 
Yosh, at the end of the episode, they decide to be in a relationship, and honestly, I love that scene of them. Like, you know, it rained at the fireworks festival, and then they're in bed, and they're soaking wet, and I actually really love that scene. I think it's really well done in the anime, is what I'm trying to say. I think that scene is done really well in the anime. Okay, so again, even their first appearance, before they even get together, before they even talk about it, before the first kiss, Yoshino does love Hattori. So I think I remember Yoshino as being a little bit too wishy-washy, like he was flipping back and forth, or he wasn't really being confident. But no, we actually do see early on that he loves, he really does have feelings for Hattori. And then... At some other point, at some other point, in a later episode, he talks about Hattori and Yanase. I think he's still, in the, he's still under the impression that Yanase has a crush on Hattori. At this point, Hattori and Yoshino are a couple. But he starts thinking about how he likes both Hattori and Yanase, but he's trying to figure out, does he love them both romantically? So first, he imagines himself kissing Hattori, and he blushes. Then he imagines himself kissing Yanase, and he immediately is like, No, absolutely not. No, no, never gonna happen. No. And then he realizes, Huh, that's how I feel. Does that mean Hattori is special? Again, more evidence of him actually loving Hattori and not loving Yanase. So I'm, I was actually really glad to see that. I also love their scene. Where um, after the New Year's Eve party, Hattori and Yoshino end up getting into a fight. They end up arguing because they're not sure where they're at right now. They don't know if they're a couple. Hattori thinks it was obvious, but Yoshino, to Yoshino, it wasn't that obvious because they didn't really talk about it. And Yoshino is jealous because he thinks that he should be in a relationship with Hattori. But then Hattori also has Erika Ichino's is perfume on him and they talk about it and they have a good conversation i love that conversation it really is just them coming to a more mutual understanding and actually early in that episode hatori does force a kiss on him and yoshino is taken aback because well it was by force and he wasn't prepared for it they talk about in this episode that yeah i think that's a normal reaction like yoshino says i think anyone would react it that way if you just suddenly kiss him and said they do it when they're both on the same page and when like basically Hattori gives them a heads up in some way and they have a consensual gentle kiss and they decide yeah they're gonna try this again or try this for real they're gonna be a couple they'll do their best and that they love each other beautiful moment we also see evidence of again Yoshino loving Hattori in the episode where ultimately it's revealed that it's Yoshino's birthday, so Yoshino goes on a trip with Yanase to like a a bathhouse, I think, or a hot spring place. It's something like that. And and Hattori is upset that Yoshino's leaving on this day. And Yoshino can't understand why, but then ultimately it's revealed that Yoshino forgot that it was his birthday that day. And he realizes that's why Hattori wanted me to stay back. Hattori probably had something planned for me. And, like, they get into a fight, but then Hattori apologizes, wishes him happy birthday. And Yoshino goes back because he, again, he loves Hattori and he wants to see him on that day. He wants to celebrate his birthday with him. It's just so sweet. Now to get to one of my favorite moments in the entire series. Hattori's, like, super jealous of Yanase and Yoshino and, like, their friendship with each other. Like, every time Yoshino even mentions Yanase by name, Hattori's, like, immediately jealous and thinks that, like, Yanase's gonna steal him, that Yoshino's, like, falling for him. It's this whole thing. And they finally talk about it, or Yoshino tries to tell him about it, tries to tell him what happened, tries to clarify things and talk about how he feels. Hattori jumps to the conclusion that Yoshino wants to break up with him, that Yoshino doesn't actually like men that Yoshino's actually straight but then pretending to be gay just to appease Hattori and Yoshino's taking it back because again we do know that he loves Hattori and that's not how Yoshino feels this whole exchange happens Hattori's basically speaking for Yoshino 
And then Hattori's on his way out, sorry, okay, like, I'll accept the breakup as is, but please just end it quickly. And then Yoshino? Yoshino Chiaki? Losing is like, all right, that's it. And he yells at Hattori like, dude, I t I'm telling you, that is not it. I am not in love with Yase. Do you really think I would like be with a man? I would like be in a relationship with a man just out of sympathy? Like, no. Like, I want to be with you is basically the point of this whole speech. And I just love it. Like the music cuts out and it's just Yoshino yelling, speaking up. For himself finally asserting like dude stop jumping to conclusions if you were having problems you should have been the one to speak up and while i do feel bad for not being clear the first time if you were having problems with this if you were having issues you should have spoken up don't jump to conclusions about how i feel and then become all emo over it <laughs> it's I love that scene so much for a number of reasons. One, Yoshino speaking up and really, again, giving his side of the relationship, showing that he is, in fact, in it because he wants to be, not because he's being forced to. It's not a case of, like, the dominant person roping them into the relationship. No, Yoshino's there because he wants to be. This is, this is two-sided relationship. They both love each other. He wants to be in it because he loves Hattori, not because he has sympathy for him. No, he truly wants to be with Hattori. And just seeing that reinforced, it's just a fantastic moment. Just seeing that, him speaking up for himself, I love it so much. I actually wish that that was the last episode that we saw with them. Unfortunately, the next episode, also a great episode, but I think this one was just so strong and so well done. I just love it. So overall, my thoughts on Yoshino and Hattori as a couple. Yeah, Hattori himself still has problematic moments. I do acknowledge that. So they're not my favorite couple for that reason. I am pleasantly surprised and glad to see that Yoshino really does love Hattori and it is shown all throughout their arc that, he, again, he's not wishy-washy and he really doesn't feel that way about Yanase. We do see that. We ultimately see that again when he punches Yanase. So yeah, I'm pleasantly surprised with that couple. Again, strictly anime adaptation of the couple, not the manga or the light novels. Strictly anime. Yeah, I, I really do love it. I'm not saying they're the best couple, but I can watch their episodes without being totally grossed out. In the proposed hen special, seeing them talk about marriage, and then again, Chiaki on his own tells Hattori that he really wouldn't mind if it ended up that way, if they ended up getting married. Yet another example of Chiaki on his own admitting his love for Hattori that I just really love. Also, you Yase is freaking Levi Ackerman. Do you hear it? Like, I don't hear it. But I looked up the voice actor, I'm like, what? Bro, this show, how the frick did that? That's Levi! How? Ironically, for them being my favorite couple, I don't have that much to say about them. At least I don't think I do. I think I love them because when they're actually together, when Yukina and Kisa are actually together, they have great moments together. I love that scene where Yukina spits out facts about himself to Kisa in order to prove that he loves him. Kisa admits like, yeah, I really don't know anything about you. And Kisa's so down on himself. And then seeing Yukina like spout out all these facts just to make, try to make Kisa see that he really does love him. I think the thing I love about the relationship, even if it's not the most realistic, is just, I just love Yukina as a character. I love Kisa as a character. What they do for each other. Yukina is always trying to make Kisa have more confidence in himself, trying to show that he really does love him. The love is genuine. You don't have to hide who you are. You don't have to hide your past. I love you for who you are. And I also love their interactions in Propose Hen, in that special. It's just so sweet. I love them seeing together, being comfortable with each other. Like, and there's like this playful banter where like Yukina's trying to flirt with him and then like Kisa's like flirting back, like 
you pervert. That's like so cute and consensual. It's truly just so sweet to see them happy together. Yeah, I think, I guess at the end of it, I like Yukina and Kisa because they're the least problematic. I truly love their moments together. I love their moments together. I love like just this glimmer of hope that Yukina gives Kisa. Kisa's very down on himself. And he has many reasons to be like he's comparing himself to his co-worker, his younger co-workers and seeing him feel, not feel that special but then seeing him be happy because now he finally has the someone in his life who appreciates him. And also seeing how like Yukina is so understanding that he actually like he's not mad when Yukina has to sorry when Kisa has to cancel the last minute like he's so understanding that Kisa thinks that's because he doesn't love him, but it's actually because he does. If I had to pick a favorite couple, it would probably be them. But right now, I just love the series altogether. Actually, I will talk about, I guess my favorite right now is probably, mm, I don't know, actually. I really like Yokozawa and Kirishima. I was really happy to see them in Propose Hen. I wasn't anticipating it. I love them. They're not actually covered in the animated series, but they do have their own movie. I rewatched the movie and I love it. I love their development so much and seeing it again loves me even more. I think Yokozawa is my favorite character. Like back in the day, I thought the movie was a great um, addition to his arc, but I think, but I never consider him like a favorite character, but like now I think he's legitimately like my favorite character or at least one of my favorite characters in the series. Just, and it's so cool because like I hated him. Well, keep in mind, he's supposed to rival Onodera. He is basically an obstacle for Onodera. Still, this time around, I completely understood where he was coming from. For the most part, like, at the end of the day, he, was, he wants the best for Takano. So to see that the person who hurt Takano is now back in his life and causing Takano to have hopes again, to, you know, to get his hopes up, he could potentially get hurt again. And again, Onodera was kind of going back and forth. He was being wishy-washy. And Yokozawa wasn't here for it. Like, no, if you don't love him, like, don't. Like, you're hurting him. Stay away from him. So I understood that when he started taking it a little too far, but um, to the point where it could potentially sabotage Onodera's career, while I wasn't a fan of Yokozawa in that moment, I know where he's coming from. And that scene where he breaks down, basically breaks down and confesses everything to Takano is just so heartbreaking. And the music adds to it, like, to see this complete breakdown of this character, this character who's always playing up a front, who's always strong, that he's actually really, really heartbroken, really emotional because he really believed that he could be a good person a good fit for Takano, he wanted the best for Takano, and now ultimately he's being rejected not just by Takano, he's not just being rejected by Takano, he's being turned down in favor of the person that hurt Takano in the first place, like that's brutal. And he was, and then to see him in the movie and the light novels, just seeing the light that Kirishima brings him, seeing Kirishima basically pull him out of his slump. I actually want to do a movie versus light novel comparison of, you know, the Yokozawa Takafumi no Bai movie. I actually want to com do a comparison video. Point is, like, just seeing that development and seeing this other side of, of Yokozawa in the movie, seeing him as the protagonist, this person who is basically an antagonist or a rival in the animated series, and now he's the main character of the movie, and we're seeing him go through all the most, we're seeing him be like embarrassed, seeing his hills and valleys, seeing him lose, seeing him with those funny animated, you know what I mean, like anime faces, <laughs> they're just so funny, so seeing them in the proposed head was like so heartwarming, I love it, and again, I'm rereading the novels, I think right now there are like six light novels, I don't know how many I read, or if I read all of them, or if they were even available, or if, like, all six were available back then, or I don't know what. But I see that there are six right now. I'm only on the second one. Because, again, it's only been a week. And 
I don't have the time to read all of it, but I also just love the scene when Takano stands up for Onodera to Yokozawa. And here's where he starts to see, you know what, all this time where Ritsu kept bringing up Yokozawa, I'm starting to see where that's coming from. So that development, again, it is very gradual. I think it's pretty realistic in terms of timing. Just another thing I love about the show. It's, at the end of the day, even though this is a boys' love show, it's, the thing about boys' love, it, it's less about representation for LGBTQ characters and more for catering to a specific audience. This show has so much heart. It really does have so much heart. And the characters are true. I think for the most part, they really are relatable. They really do feel like characters, people I can meet in real life, feeling this out. I don't know, like just, again, just compared to Junja Romanica, I'm just like, what? Like, what, what even is this? It's like, I don't know, I guess between the two shows, I think Sekaiichi Hatsukoi wins out in its characters. I just think they're so relatable. We see them in different situations, and I just really love them. I enjoy watching them. I want to see more of them. I want to see them develop more. And I just love the show, so I'm glad to say that I do love this show. I still love the show. I, I, it is one of my favorites. Now, it's not like the same level of quality as something like Attack on Titan or Avatar The Last Airbender or Bojack Horseman. Like, I consider those like top tier shows. Best shows of all time that I think everybody should see. I don't know if I would recommend Sakaichi Hatsukoi because of the problematic elements. Oh, yeah, I also forgot to mention the stalking. Like, yeah, it's not predatory stalking, but it is still stalking nonetheless. Point is, like, there are very valid reasons why people wouldn't like the show. That's not for everybody. The show doesn't age horribly. Even back then, it was never okay. Even when I watched it, I knew that these problematic elements, I am not for this. So I'm just gonna acknowledge that they exist, but not focus on it. And again, in the anime, it's scant enough that I don't have to focus on it. I can focus on all the other good bits. Because, especially with Onodera and Takano and Chiaki and Hattori, they do have a lot of great moments. They have a lot of great moments that... I think overshadow the not so pretty stuff. So again, I don't know if I would recommend it, watch at your discretion, but I will say the one thing about this show that ages beautifully, that will not age terribly, the music. I love this soundtrack. Even back then, I considered it my favorite soundtrack of all time, one of my favorites of all time, and I Again, with watching the series, I love it so much. I, once again, it is still my favorite of all time, and I found it on Spotify, and I've been listening to it nonstop every single day on my way to work, on my way back from work, sometimes during lunch if I'm walking, like walking back to my office. I listen to a track, and oh my god, the entire soundtrack is amazing. That's another place where Sekaiichi Hatsukoi wins out over Ginger Romanica. The soundtrack is godly. For the anime specifically, I feel like Ginger Romanica was a test run. And then whatever, you know, Ginger Romanica, the first two seasons aired. And then with Sekaiichi Hatsukoi, they freaking nailed it. Like the characters, the pacing, the music, the freaking music, the openings and the EDs are fantastic. And then all the background tracks are freaking amazing. I feel like the reason why the scenes work is because of the music. Like, that scene where, you know, the very first scene in the OVA, where Takano gets the book for him, the piano track that plays, it just makes the entire scene. Or the violin and piano piece that plays when, like, Takano says, I've been in love with you for the past 10 years. Again, during the snow episode. And that same track that also plays when they're in the library at the end of the OVA. Chef's Kiss. That is probably my favorite soundtrack. My favorite track on the entire soundtrack. 
Oh my, but really every single song. I've been listening to some of the songs that I didn't really listen to back in the day and really listen to the whole thing. And it, it takes you by surprise. Like, wow, I was not expecting that. That was really good. And even the more funny bits, the more hilarious <laughs> things that happen, <laughs> the more funny songs. Like track five. Track five is the one I'm thinking about. I don't know the names because they're all in Japanese. But track five on the album whatever that track plays, it just makes me want to laugh. It's just, the music is so good. I think, oh yeah, that's another thing. I think now, I think the reason why I love the anime so much is because the music is that good. Now, for people who haven't seen it, yes, the soundtrack stands on its own, so you could listen to the soundtrack on its own, and, you know, I, I think that people will enjoy it, but I, I also want people to watch the anime. It's because the music works so well with the scenes it's put in. Like, and the anime wouldn't be as good as it is if it weren't for the music. Or like that at the end of episode three where Takano and Onodera, you know, they're in Takano's apartment. Onodera tries to leave. He opens the door. Just the track that plays there is so good. Like, how, how does this exist? Honestly, to every single person who is involved in the making of the soundtrack, the people who composed the music, the people who played the music, and the people who, like, edited it for, like, these scenes. <laughs> Bro. Yes. Yes. I hope you are all having wonderful lives. This soundtrack is truly, truly amazing. And also recognizing that yeah, some of these songs actually share similar musical motifs that I didn't catch back in the day, that I'm catching now. I love it. So, final thoughts. I love it just as much. If you don't love it, that is completely valid. But please listen to the soundtrack. But actually, yeah, that's where I'm really confused. Because of the problematic elements, I don't want to recommend it. I guess watch at your own discretion. Watch at your own discretion. See if you like it. Again, I think the music complements it so well. I guess what you could do is watch the anime. If you're not into it, just listen to the soundtrack. It's amazing. Oh my gosh, this is going to be a pain to edit. It's been a while since I've made a video, but... Yeah, that was my thoughts on Sekaiichi Hatsukoi. And I I have in the back of my head that I want to do... Um, an anime versus light novel comparison of the Yokozawa Takafumi no Bai book and yeah those are my thoughts does it hold up does Sekaiichi Hatsukoi hold up yeah I'd say so I think it holds up it's not gonna be for everybody but it'll always be one of my favorites take care guys